Well, we're going to close out our eight-week series. It's hard to believe we've been in overwhelmed for eight weeks. How many of you don't want to be overwhelmed anymore? All right. So life can be overwhelming. We've talked about the challenges that life can bring our way. And I wish I could tell you that all your problems are going to go away, that this eight-week series has solved it all, and you're never going to struggle again. If I could do that, we'd have to build two more sanctuaries because we'd never be able to hold everybody. But I believe that we have found the key to what God wants to do in our lives and, and found the solution to that overwhelming feeling that we can get. We've talked about some tough subjects, stress, anxiety, fear, depression, worry. We talked about having gratitude. We've talked about being repentant and turning from our sins. We've talked about a, a plethora of things over the last few weeks. And I've got some probably some of the most encouraging messages that I've ever gotten from any other series that we've ever done. I got more messages from the week that I spoke on depression than any of the weeks altogether. Because I believe that we're living in a time that if we take life at face value, life can weigh you down and it can steal your joy real quick and you can get in a dark place if you're not careful. And Jesus can get you out of that darkness. Amen? Just like we saw in the testimony. We talked about repentance. Repentance being turning from your sin. I got a lot of, uh, of uh, messages and stuff from that. The one, one where I came up here with the IV bag and that little pole. It, it helps to have illustrations to help ingrain that in our brains and to remember those things. I had a young person tell me this last week. said, Pastor Derek, this series has really helped me. I even invited a friend to come to church with me, and they gave their hearts to the Lord too. So here's the thing. What we're doing here is not just about us. It's about those that do life with us and them finding Christ as well. Amen? So it's a lot going on around us. But as we move through the book of Daniel, maybe your brain processes things a lot like mine does. As you read the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you read about Daniel, and you think, yay, I'm so glad everything worked out for Daniel. You know, he, did, he went in the lion's den and he came out. Hip, hip, hooray. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They went into the fiery furnace and came out and didn't even smell like smoke. Yay for them. But what about me? Because I'm still going through some stuff and I still got a, a lot of things going on in my life and I still feel overwhelmed in some areas of my life. Well, I get it. You say, I'm ready for God to deliver me. Well, so am I. I want to see a 2024 size miracle, a 2024 miracle in my life. Amen? How about you? Because listen, I do get it. I get how the weight of the world, things going on in relationships, life can be tough. The enemy's going to make sure that he makes it even tougher. And it's hard not to let your emotions take over. It's hard to not feel overwhelmed in some of the situations that we go through. And we just want to throw in the towel and say, I can't do this anymore. Well, that's what this series has been about. And I even had somebody say, but pastor, do you really believe that God still does miracles today? Absolutely 100%. See, the thing is, is I believe that God not only wants to do miracles, that he can do miracles, and I believe he wants to do them in your life and in my life. He's the God that still does the miracles, but it's a daily journey of pursuing after him. So as I was going through the, the last few days, and I was saying, what do we need to end on in this series? How do we end a seven-week series at that point on being overwhelmed? Well, when I'm overwhelmed, what's the one thing I don't have? Peace. I don't have peace. That's what I want. I want peace in my life. I want something that makes my heart feel not so overwhelmed and at peace with everything going on around me. And the good news is that God is the giver of peace, and he can give that peace to you, and he can give that peace to me. But then the devil comes in. And how many of you know, I hate the devil. He comes in and he starts saying, well, he did it for Daniel. He did it for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ain't going to do it for you. Why? Because you know what you did. You know how you've been acting. You ain't been doing things God's way. You haven't been in your word like you should. You haven't been praying like you should. He's going to tell you, you're not worthy. And you know what you tell him? You're right. I'm not. Because my worthiness doesn't come based on what I do or how God or what I do in my life. It comes on him, and he's the one that makes me worthy. Amen? So here's the thing. You agree with the devil. When he tells you you're not worthy, you go, I know. And isn't that the coolest thing about Jesus and the cross? Because of him, I am worthy. So shut your pie hole, devil, right? And you put him in his place. Because here's the thing that I know. As I was putting all this together, it popped in my head. This bumper sticker you used to see a lot in the 90s. I see it every once in a while. No God, K-N-O-W. No God, no peace. But no God... And you're not going to have peace. No peace. So here, that's, that's so true. It's absolutely. That if you know God, you can know peace. But if you have no God, you will not be able to have peace. Not a long-lasting one anyway. 
So I started doing a deep dive into the Bible. What does the Bible say about peace? Because God is, again, the giver of peace, and I found that there's two types of peace. And I want to ask you, who in here wants peace in your life? Let me see your hand. All right? Smart folks in the room. Because there's going to be some people, no, you know, I want misery and I want uh, calamity. I'll take stomach ulcers for three, Alex, you know, and all those kind of things. And we're just like, I'll take all the bad stuff. I don't want any of the bad stuff. I want the calamity and the chaos and all that to go away. And I want the peace of God. The Bible says it passes all understanding, active and moving in my life. So I began to study peace. And one of the things that I found is there's two types of peace. Number one, peace with God. See, the thing is, what you don't realize is before we knew God, before we were saved, before we we gave our lives to Christ, he still loved us. But there was a great divide between us and God. Our sins separated us from God. And so the thing is, is, we have to make peace with God and settle that sin issue that's in our lives. I want to ask, where's all my married folks in the room? Let me see your hands. All right. Put them down. Now, where's all my married folks that's ever had an argument with your spouse? All right, don't lie. Some of you are sitting here, I, I would even ask this, how many of you are in an argument right now? But I'm not going to do that and start another fight, all right? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's the thing. You can have a fight and you can be upset with one another for a few minutes. You can have a doozy and be upset with each other for a few hours. Or you can have the granddaddy of all fights and throw that silent treatment on your partner and ignore them for days. And you walk about around the house and you're like, I hope you don't get hungry because I ain't making you nothing. You know, I hope you don't need anything from me. I ain't giving you... You can get that way, and you can give them the silent treatment. And I have found that in Kelly and I's life, to let you in on the, on the behind the scenes, we argue over the dumbest stuff. And that usually causes the biggest risk. And who is the one that does the biggest, dumbest stuff? It's always me. And you solve it with two little words. I'm sorry. But I'm not always that smart. And I don't say I'm sorry because I, 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 I don't know how. I, sometimes it's just like, well, I'm not 100% in the wrong. Some of y'all are laughing because you know where I'm coming from. And then being the dum-dum, sometimes we've been at odds with each other. And we haven't been talking like, you know, and we haven't been conversing. Then I'll go and I'll ask a stupid question just so I can open up the conversation. Have any of you guys ever done that? And you walk in like, hey, I can't find the ketchup. You know where the ketchup is? And you're just hoping that she'll bite and come in and go, oh, here it is, sweetheart, I love you. And now we're back on good terms. And we hope that we just can crank up the conversation again. Usually never works for me either. So what do we do? Then we move to giving gifts and we move to acts of kindness and that never works either. And so what do we do? We have to go all the way back to the old, good old fashioned, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And see, the sad thing is we do that in our physical relationships with one another, but I think we do the same thing to God. I think when we blow it, when we're in a rift with one another, when there's some some distance, maybe we're a little upset with God because we're in an overwhelming situation, and God, I know that you could have come through for me, and you didn't, so I'm a little upset, so I'm not talking to you right now. And we have this rift with God, and then when we make a mistake or we sin, we Adam and Eve God, and we run from him. And how many of you know God didn't run from Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve ran from God. And then what did God do? God went looking for them. And so here's the thing. In this room, there are some people that are far from God, and you're far from the peace of God, and God sent you here today because he's been looking for you. And he wants a relationship back with you. He wants to bridge this gap that sin has caused in your life. And he says, I've already settled it. You've just got to receive it, and you've got to come to me. And I'll give you peace. I'll give you rest. I'll give you forgiveness. I'll give you eternal life. And so here's the thing. Sin separated us from God. And when I have done something that I know that's sinful, I have a tendency to pull back from God. We don't worship the same. We don't come into his presence the same. Sometimes we won't even come to church because we feel so guilty or we feel like God must be mad at me and you know i got to give it like that, that three to five day waiting period before his grace kicks in. No, God doesn't have that. And we don't act the same when there's distance between us. Just like husbands and wives don't act the same when there's a rift between you. So what I'm going to do is I want to teach you today how to bridge the rift. How to find peace with God if you've never found peace with God. Because you can't good your way to God. A lot of people will try. They'll come in and they'll try to add on a dose of religion. They'll come to church and try to serve. Like you can't serve your way into a good relationship with God. You can't get... uh, 100%, you don't get a gold star for perfect attendance because how many of you know the devil's here every single week? Some of them, he rode with some of us, all right? So here's the thing. He walked in with us. But here's the thing. 
You can't good your way to God. You can't be moral enough to bridge the gap. You can't say, I'm not going to cuss, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to chew, I'm not going to do all this kind of stuff and all these things that the world thinks that, that is separating us from God. And I'm not going to do those things so that I can be close to you. And God says, that's not, what's, that's not what's separating me. It's that your heart's far from me. So you can't good work your way to God. You can't be moral enough to get to God. You can't do any of those things. The only thing that bridges the gap between you and God, me and God, is what Jesus Christ did on the cross that we talked about it at Easter. See, the thing is, we were headed to hell. We were headed to sin. And Jesus Christ said, i got to do something about that. And you've got to do a 180. You've got to do a turn. And you've got to head to the way of the cross. And Christ put his life down and bridged that gap so that we could have a way back to the Father. It's the cross that does that. Because Jesus is alive and well today. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. The Bible tells us that he's praying for you and he's praying for me. Because he knew that there was a separation. He knew that we needed peace. Because you can't have peace with God without a relationship with God. And Jesus said the only way you can find it is not by being good enough. Not by coming to church enough. Not by serving enough. Not by volunteering at a local charity enough. You can't do any of that to bridge that gap. The only thing that can do it is you finding peace with God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith. You know what justified truly means? I learned this in junior high school. Just if I'd never sinned. When I'm justified through my faith, it's like God wipes your slate clean and says, Hey, I ain't going to talk about that no more. I'm going to choose to forget your, all your past sins. And it says, Then we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where you find peace. By making Jesus Christ your Lord. Through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. you got to get to the cross. And the only way to get to the cross is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he, then you'll be justified as if you've never sinned. And you find forgiveness and you find peace with God. And Jesus is the only way to find peace with God. And when you do that, when you find peace with God, he fills your heart with his presence. He fills your heart, your heart with his spirit. And Galatians 5 tells us that the Holy Spirit fills our heart. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit being in your heart is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And peace is one of those gifts, one of those fruits. So my big question to you today is, have you ever had a point in your life where you turned your life over to God? You surrendered your life to Christ. A time where you realize I'm separated from God and I don't want to be anymore. I want to be close to God. I want the peace with God. And you repented of your sins, which again means that you turn from them. Because you know what happens at a lot of churches? This is where I think a lot of people mess up in their walk with Jesus. We're real good confessors. We'll own up to our sin. When people, we'll go to God and say, hey, God, forgive me for this. And we confess our sins to him. The problem is he wants you to confess, but he also wants you to repent. We talked about that a moment ago. Repent means to do that 180 degree turn and head in the other direction towards the cross. And churches and Christians all over the world have fooled themselves into believing that they're in peace with God because they confess their sins, but they never turn from it. They're still living in their sin. And God says, go and sin no more. And we got to leave that life of sin and turn to a life of peace with God. That's the key. And when you find peace with God, what comes after that is number two, the peace of God. We receive his peace in our life. We, you know, we live in the Bible Belt. We live in the South. And so many people go to church, but we forget to become the church. Let me explain it this way. You, going to church, again, doesn't save you. Saying a prayer at the end of the service doesn't save you. We do it every single week. We introduce you to God through that prayer. But that prayer has no power to save you. The only thing that has the power to save you is a relationship with Jesus. The prayer introduces you to it. But then you have to come close to God and you have to repent and turn from your, your sinful lifestyle. And that's what salvation is. That's where you find the peace of God. Only through a relationship with him. Because without Jesus, we're walking straight towards hell, like I said a moment ago. We're walking straight towards chaos and crazy. And I don't know about you. Have you ever felt like you've got a season ticket to chaos and crazy? It's like it shows up at your door every day and that you're visited nonstop. And you're like, I'm done with the chaos. I'm done with the crazy in life. How about some peace of God? So I'm ready to quit punching my ticket to chaos and crazy and find the peace of God that passes all understanding for my heart and life. So what am I saying? Peace with God leads to the peace of God. 
Some of you right now, that's what you're missing. You're missing the peace of God. And that's why Paul writes this in Philippians 4, 5 to 7. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Not your attitude, because we all see that. Not your ability to argue your point. Not your ability to dig your heels in and stand your ground. He says right here, let your gentleness be evident to all. Because the Lord is near. Look what happens when the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, gratitude that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Present your request to God. And what happens? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus. Do you know what that means to transcend your understanding? That means when the world looks at you, and they're like, I see what you're going through. And I see how you're living. And you have joy and you have peace. I don't understand how you can go through this and still have peace. It transcends. It blows my mind. It transcends my understanding. And that's what God is saying. God is going to give you the ability to go through the things and the storms that life throws your way. And he'll give you a peace that blows your mind that the world won't be able to fathom. But so many people never experience the peace of God because they've never made peace with God. Because they think that God's expecting them to be perfect. See, God's not here expecting you to be perfect. He's expecting you to repent, to turn from your sin and come to him. And then guess what? If you make a mistake and you blow it and you sin again, you turn back. And if you sin and you turn the way of the world again, you turn back. You just keep turning back and receiving his peace, praying, and God will give you the power to where one day you quit turning to that thing. And you quit turning to that attitude. You quit turning to that, that habit. But you just keep turning. Because life is tough. Church, I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that life is easy. That you're not going to go through overwhelming circumstances. But you can go through those overwhelming circumstances and still have the peace of God. That's why this title today of this message is Overwhelming Peace. Because I've been overwhelmed by life. I've been overwhelmed by my situations. I've been overwhelmed by some conditions that I've had to go through. But I want to have overwhelming peace that that's what floods my soul. And how do you get it? By keeping your eyes fixed on the Lord. That's called exercising your faith because when something goes boom, what do you want to do? You immediately want to turn and look. Well, I don't want to keep looking to the noise. I want to keep turning to the Father because the enemy's going to try to distract you. When you're up on a ledge, when you're high up and, and, and people are trying to help you get off, like you're on a tightrope or on a ledge on a building or something that's burning, what is the one thing they tell you to do? Don't look. Don't look down. And what do you do? You look down. Why? Because you told me not to. And then we freak out and we scream like a little girl. Ah! And we're all panicked and petrified. And what do you do? When you see it and you look down, you grab a hold of where you're at. Do you know why the devil wants you to keep looking at what you're going through and distracting you? Because he wants you to get so paralyzed and so fearful that you cling to where you're at so that you can't get to where you need to go. Because let's just say this was a ledge. I didn't do this the other two services, so y'all pray I can get back up. But I'm on a fiery ledge and I'm crawling across. And if I look down and I get scared, I'm going to be paralyzed and I'm going to be frozen. And I'm going to grab a hold of that ledge and I'm going to be afraid that I'm going to fall. And I'm stuck right where I'm at. But see, the safety is right over there at the foot of the cross. And the enemy wants to paralyze you in your sin. He wants to paralyze you in your grief. He wants to paralyze you and get a hold of your heart so that what you're facing, your marriage, your, your, whatever, your job, whatever you're going through that's got you stressed out and overwhelmed right now, he wants you to keep your eyes focused on that so that your muscles lock up and you grab a hold of it and you don't let go. But I'm telling you, crawl to the cross. Get to safety. Because that's where your peace is found. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Because when you get your eyes focused on everything that's going wrong in your life, that's going to steal your peace. And it's going to lock you in position where you're at. Isaiah 26.3 says, God, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed, whose eyes are focused on you because he trusts in you. You want the perfect peace of God? Get your eyes off of everything that's wrong and get them on the cross and say, I'm going to quit belly aching. I'm going to quit whining. I'm going to quit moaning. I'm going to quit being the Debbie Downer. And I'm going to get my eyes on the cross because I'm not going to get locked in my overwhelming situation. So stay focused. Keep looking to God. That's the only way you're going to make it through the eye of your storm. 
Quit getting on news all the time. That's just going to lock you in place, too. That's going to depress you even more. Quit getting on social media so much. Quit worrying about all the people that don't like you. How many of you know there's always going to be somebody that doesn't like you? You can spend the rest of your days trying to, to win everybody over. If you do it, you did something Jesus couldn't do. They hated him, too. People were at odds with him, too. You're going to spend the rest of your life trying to win the crowds but lose your peace in the process. And you just hand it over to them. And I'm tired of letting people have that access to my peace. The world didn't give it, and I'm not going to let the world take it away. Amen? But the storms are going to hit. Worries are going to hit. The devil's going to throw you those curveballs, but you've got to be ready to swat them right back in his face. And how do you do that? How do you keep your eyes focused on God? I wish you, some of you are like, well, I want the, I want the five-step method. I'm going to give you two steps of how to stay focused on God. And it's so simple, many of you are going to go, oh, my gosh, why are you telling me to do that? Because it works. Number one, stay in his word. I don't understand it. Well, you will when you keep in it. The Holy Spirit will begin to reveal the truths to you. Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have those who love your law. How many of you want great peace? Not just a little dab of do your peace. I, I don't want a little bit of peace. I want a lot of peace. I want great peace. And it comes to those who love his word. And nothing can make them stumble. You ever played that game where you stand there with somebody and you, you smack? And then somebody always does like that? I never could keep my balance. But it's saying right here, if you want great peace and never want to stumble, the devil can smack against you. But you're rooted and grounded in his word and you will never falter. you got to stay in his word. The second way to stay focused on God is prayer. That's why I wear my pray first bracelet because that's not always my first inclination. I wish I could tell you that immediately when the devil comes against me or hard times hit that I start praying. No, I start mumbling and I start murmuring and I start complaining. That's my nature. But lately, I have been praying, and I've gotten a whole lot better than when people are mean, I pray for them. Not for them to die, but for God to bless them. It's a difference. But I want great peace. And I want to read it to you again, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I read it a moment ago, but repetition is the key to learning. But I want to highlight something else. It says, don't be anxious about anything. How many of you know that's easier said than done? But in every situation, how many, when he says every situation, what does he mean? Every situation. By prayer and petition, praying, with thanksgiving, and an attitude of gratitude that we talked about last week, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. Pray about everything, be grateful, and then his peace will flood in. And Jesus said it this way. This was one of the promises that he gave to his followers right before he went to the cross. John 14, 27. He said, guys, basically you're fixing to go through some junk. You're going to see some crazy stuff. But this is what I'm going to do. Peace I leave with you because your heart's going to want to freak out. When the enemy comes against you, you're going to want to run in a million different directions. But peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And when I read that again, I saw something that I hadn't noticed before. The choice, the ball is in your court. Do not let your hearts be troubled. In other words, they can be troubled, but you don't have to let them be. And don't be afraid. You can be fearful, but you don't have to be. So don't let. You have the power within your, your hands, in your life, in your mind, to be fearful and to be troubled. But how do you get rid of the fear and the trouble? Getting close to the cross, praying, getting in his word. That's the peace giver. And all through John 14, Jesus is sitting here telling him, say, here's what you're going to do, and here's how you, you're going to see some horrific things, but this is how you're going to have my peace. And do you know what I love the most about our church? This room is filled with people who showed up one day that didn't have peace with God. Maybe they'd had church hurt in the past, but then they found peace with God. Then all of a sudden, God began to flood their hearts with the peace of God. And we can't take credit for it. We're, we're not the peace givers, but what we do is when you come here, you don't just go to church and say and hi to everybody and pass out your business cards if you still have them and make connections and then go out and live your life. See, we get close to the cross, and we invite you to come get close with us. And like Paul said, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. And I can't give you peace, but I can tell you where to find it. I can't make your problems go away, but I can tell you where to find peace in the midst of your problems. And if you'll follow me, 
I'll show you the way and I'll show you how to get close. That's what our church is all about. Because I want peace. Because we're going to go through some tough stuff in life. And this life's not easy, and Jesus told us that that was going to be the case, but we can have peace in the midst of it all. John 16, says, I've told you these things. In other words, why are you acting so surprised? When things don't go your way, when you hit tough times, why are you acting like I didn't tell you? He says, so that in me you may have peace. Because in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. In other words, the world, the world doesn't have to overtake you because I overcame the world. And I'm not talking about that southern Sunday morning I go to church type stuff. I'm talking about the real deal stuff where he gives you peace because you found a relationship with God. So I want to close with this, a story of a king. This king gathered all the artists in the kingdom and he said, I want you to paint me a portrait of what you think peace looks like. I want to see through your eyes what you think the epitome of peace would be. Well, everybody painted their pictures and they submitted them to the king. And he didn't like any of them except for two, and he kept two. Painting number one was of a very calm and peaceful lake, and behind it was a big mountain range, beautiful. And that lake was so calm and crystal clear that the reflection of the mountain range could be seen on the surface of that lake. There were blue skies everywhere, big, huge, puffy clouds above them. And the painting was so beautiful that everybody said, this is the one he's going to choose. There's no way he couldn't choose this one. But he didn't. He chose the second one. It was a painting of a mountain range, just like the first one. But these mountains were sharp and rugged and rough. Over the top of those mountains were huge storm clouds with lightning bolts coming from them. Coming off the side of the mountain was a thunderous waterfall that was huge to where it had cleared a path through all the the trees. It splashed over the top and hit with such a huge force at the bottom that you could see it. You could almost hear it looking at the picture to where it made such a loud, thunderous roar and it leveled everything at the bottom of the mountain. But if you look real close, just behind the edge of the waterfall, there was a nest with a bird just going about their merry day, tending to their nest and tending to their little chicks. In the midst of all the storm clouds and in the midst of the thunderous roar of the waterfall. She was surrounded in that nest by turmoil, danger, and noise, yet she was at perfect peace in the midst of it all. And that's the picture the king chose. And he said, peace doesn't mean you'll be in a place where there's no noise, trouble, or hard work. Peace means that you can be in the midst of all of those things and still be calm in your heart. That's the real meaning of peace. And I think the problem with us a lot of times as believers is that we want the storms to go away. We want Jesus to make all our problems go away. But Daniel still went into the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego still went into the fiery furnace. But that was one heck of a testimony that came out of it. And see, I think as Christians, yes... I want God to take my problems away. And when he does, I will thank him. If there's a disease or a sickness, I want God to heal that disease and that sickness to be gone. So I do believe he's a miracle worker and he can take all of your problems and all of your storms away. But even if he doesn't, there's still peace that's found under the shelter of the wing of his cross that can't be found anywhere else. That's peace. That even when everything is going crazy in your life, you find shelter in the presence of God and you can have peace in the midst of your storm because the world's watching you. They want to know, do you really believe this? They want to know, do you just come because that's what you're supposed to do? Or do you come here because you're worshiping God because you have a relationship with Him and you found peace with God and the peace of God because you actually live it and believe it and know it to be true? That's the peace of God. Peace in the midst of the storm, in spite of the storm. And if you're here today and you're feeling overwhelmed and storms are waging all around you, you can leave that way or you can let the calm and the peace of God flood your heart. You can make peace with him. So here's what I want to do. I want to ask you, do you need Jesus as your Savior today? 
He'll forgive you of every sin you've ever committed. He'll give you a fresh start today. And if that's you, if you're saying, I, I want to make peace with God today, then I want you to bow your heads with me, everybody in the room, and I want you to pray this prayer with me out loud. Everybody in the room is going to pray it with us, so let's pray it together. Dear Lord, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And today I give you my life. Thank you for loving me, and thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name.